impromptu Lee kind of got up and shared his uh, story, uh, kind of how Christ has been transforming his life and the, the lives of the people around him. And, and I just want to thank you for being pretty straight up and honest. If you, if you haven't had a chance to see it, if you go on the, the church's Facebook page, a lot of people, when they when they think they have to share about what God's doing in their life, they think they have to be Jesus in front of everybody. And I think that's why you did the beard, right? <laughs> anyway, uh, anyway uh, and he just kind of shared about his weaknesses, but but his dependence on Christ in those weaknesses. You know, I'm just, I'm just thankful to hear that story as, as your life evolves in the gospel, as you seek the Lord and as you, you, you seek to, to please Him with everything. And that's what all of us, and we have that ability to come before God and be honest and come before other people and be honest and say, you know, I'm pretty screwed up right now. I'm pretty weak right now. I don't have everything together. Because if we did, we wouldn't need the Lord, would we? We'd be perfectly content just to, to sit there in our own form of perfection and never have to be any different. But thanks for being, being vulnerable, man. That means something. That means something to you guys, too. Because that means he's, he's okay with being that in front of him. He's okay with being honest. He's okay with you hearing the things that nobody wants to lead with. Nobody, nobody leads with, this is, how, this is how I'm in need. People lead with, this is where I'm strong. This is where I'm good. This is where I'm secure. If you only found your security in Christ, then you're able then to be honest and say, this is the place where I'm weak. This is the place where the flesh comes back and starts tempting me. And this is where the enemy's been. Do you ever get that little scratch in the back of your head? And it's like he's just digging around in there wanting to find a foothold or a place where he can leverage something that will disrupt your relationship with God. But to get up and say, Hey, I can't bind Satan. I can't take him out. We know this. Even the, the archangel Michael does not take the devil on, so why would I think I should do that? And my, my brother Andrew sent me a video of this guy talking about, like, if the church can bind Satan, how does he keep getting loose? Let him go. I'll do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or why is he releasing him to other churches, you know, to, to wreak havoc with them? So I can't do that, but the way I can resist him is to not to fall into the trap of thinking I'm okay without the Lord. Amen? Amen. And so if you didn't get a chance to see, see, see Dave last week, uh, go ahead and hop on the church's Facebook page and uh, be blessed by his uh, short testimony. That. Anybody here have issues with feeling secure in life? Secure. Like three of you, awesome. <laughs> this is a this is a secure group. How many of you suffer with feeling secure in life? Like like tomorrow is settled. It's fine. Everybody around me is my friend and is looking out for me. You know, nobody wishes to see any harm done to me. You know the the milieu that I live in or the job that I work in or the country that I'm a resident of, everything's just picture perfect. Everything's wonderful. Anybody? Or you're kind of like, I don't know what to do most of the time. I don't. <laughs> I don't know what to do a lot of the time. Because this person said that, and that's not true, but they believe that. What do I do with that? Or I'm pinching pennies, and I have a bill coming up. Is that a place where you're? You're finding yourself to be like really like I'm, I'm really confident in things right now are there some of you that have had some physical things that have been happening and I, I felt bad I, I stopped by the, the, the men's mission house the other day and I'm like I'm just gonna go back and see Pam and I open up the door and she's like you don't want to come in here <laughs> She's like, I don't know what I have, but you don't want it. I'm like, I'll just stand on the hall, okay? Physical issues where I do not feel confident in that issue to face tomorrow. Anybody? 
What do you do with that? You know, the, 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 the easy Christian Sunday school answer is just give it to the Lord. Just give it to God. Right? Well, here, God, here's my head cold. Here's my water bill. Oh, here's my water bill. Can you, can you, can you let the, the water company know that you're taking care of this? Some of those relationship things where you don't know how to answer the person. Oh, and by the way, the holidays are coming up. And those relationships may have something to do with people that you will probably see around Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's. It's the matter of the soul. What? I don't know a lot of times how to take the issues of the soul as the rest of life affects it and, and be on top of it all the time or to, to always know what God is doing in the moment. To know that I can be alright, I can trust Him. Everybody has those things and most of us start to doubt when things don't look like the way we thought they would. And that relationship went sideways. When the money ran out, when I'm in a hospital, or when I'm questioning my relationship and my walk with the Lord because it doesn't seem like He's there or answering my prayer the way that I would like Him to. It comes down to trust. It comes down to our belief in God to say that I believe that He's going to keep His word. I believe that there's no... There's no turning in him. There's no. Uh, th th there's nothing about God that would let me think that he's going to start changing his mind on a lot of things where I wouldn't know what to expect from him. So I just need to get to know him so that I can trust him. How many of you trust people you don't know? Good. Because <laughs> there's a lot of shysters out there. The more you get to know a person, the more likely it is that you can rely on them. You can trust them. The same is with the Lord. Trusting Him for the times where we're not sure how to respond or what to think or where to go or what to do next. Around 1855, there was a man named Charles Blodden, and he was an acrobat and a tiger walker. So, you know, one of those guys up there was a rope and he would walk across that. I don't know who came up with that. That seems kind of strange. Like, hey, I, I woke up today. I'm going to walk across a rope. Who does that, right? That's weird. But that's what he did. And he claimed that he could walk from one side of Niagara Falls to the other on a rope. And he was claiming that he would do this without a safety net. And some people that heard, like, this is kind of impossible without a net. Other than that, without the, the safety aspect of what you're doing, that would be treacherous at best. Now, how many of you would be like, hey, that sounds great, I'm going to do that. Just give me the fancy shoes and the right note, when you white up robe, I'll do it. Marshall, you're young. When you get a little bit older like me, you'll be like, that's a terrible idea. <laughs> But he was going to do it anyway, and so crowds came, and they even paid to watch him make the attempt. And before crossing, he asked the crowd, Do you believe that I can walk across to the other side? And the crowd yelled back, We believe! We believe you can do this! And he said, Do you believe I can cross with a man on my back? And the crowd yelled back, We believe! So, he said, who will volunteer to take the trip on my back? <laughs> I like it. And if the, the thunder of the water falling over the edge of the falls was not so thunderously loud, you probably could have heard it in your own. <clears throat> Finally, one man raised his hand. He said, I believe. He climbed on Laden's back, and the two crossed over Niagara Falls together. The man was Henry Colcord, and it was Blodden's manager. He 
trusted Lon's strength and the ability that he had with all of his heart. Now, what does it look like when we're facing something that, that could be pretty tremendously awful? And, and, and putting our trust in what we hope is the capable hands of the Lord. And we kind of look at kind of block at it a little bit like, I don't know, it was okay as long as I was a spectator. But you want me to do what? Climb on your back and trust you to walk across? No, I would rather be the one walking or the one choosing not to walk, thank you very little. Right? But we trust the Lord like this man trusted the title of Father. This morning, if you abide in front of you, I hope you do. Um, there's some in the, the chair backs, the bottoms, actually. Uh, this morning we're going to be looking in Psalm 37, verses 1 through 10. In the whole of this psalm, and I, I don't want us to get, to get wrapped up in this being something that is prescriptive, like if we just have a certain kind of response and think positively about something, that everything will end okay. Because the point of this scripture, and all scripture, it's not so that we get the, 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 the best out of a deal. The, the point of Scripture is the point is back to God to honor Him and trust Him so that whatever happens under His sovereign watch, that we respond to Him in is according to what He desires from us. And so I don't want us to get lost in the, the language that can so easily come out of passages to where it's just kind of a prescription for a good life. Because we were never promised that to begin with. We were never promised for the things, especially after we started following Christ, that everything would be sunshine and roses. In fact, the Lord himself said, in this world you will have trouble. That's a better one. I can handle trouble, but I don't know if I can handle tribulation. You're never promised in our Christianity, in our following after Christ, that we would get anything better than what we got. Amen? Amen. In fact, Paul even says, I want to be so close to the Lord that I know what it's like in his suffering. I want to be so close to God that I'm okay with suffering. Because my, my Lord and Savior went through it, I want to be okay with that. And two, I'm driven to my knees in dependence on God when I'm suffering or because I'm weak. And so when things are difficult, we're closer to God because we can't hack it. So He gets the glory. Psalm 37, 1 through 10. This is what it says Do not fret. <coughs> because of those who are evil or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon weather. Somebody are like, I got something I wish they would wither right now. <laughs> <laughs> For the, like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Verse 3, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in Him, and He will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, and your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord, and wait patiently for Him. Do not fret. There's that, that phrase again. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways when they carry out their wicked schemes. Verse 8, refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil. For those who are evil will be destroyed, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. A little while and the wicked will be no more. But when you look for them, they will not be found. God, we thank you for the, the giving and the reading of your word today. Yes. Lord, I pray that it's impressed on our hearts and minds. And Lord, that it is a 
lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path as we seek you, God. Father, we thank you for giving this to us. And grow in faith and trust in you because of you. So this morning, security. <coughs> Don't want it. Not a lot of us have it in and of ourselves. Security and some other words for it. This 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 week was really interesting. I just kind of found myself doing a lot of the sourcing. That's a word. I'll do that with the source. See if that's actually a word. Um, is that the dictionary? Anyway, security. Other words for that are safety, protection, immunity, a shield, a defense, to be invulnerable. Salvation, shelter, refuge, these are all trustable attributes, all trustable words, right? If you hear that, if you hear the word security or protection or a shield, you're like, I'm, I'm going to be okay, right? Whatever's against me, I'm going to be fine because i got something that, that intervenes or it blocks or it, it staves off an attack. I'll be fine, right? That's what that means. If we look at this passage, we start seeing what God is communicating to the people that have looked to Him for their security. You see how He starts it and what He keeps repeating, the psalmist keeps repeating here? Do not fret. Yeah, not fret, 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 do not fret. It's do not be afraid. Do not fear. Do not be anxious. So this morning, these verses, there's six, there's six things in here, God said, you gotta be about this in order to show that you really do trust me. You can't say I trust you and do nothing with it. Because then that just shows we don't trust God. And our response when he calls us to as the one who we put our hope in. So there's going to be six things that we're looking at. And also there are going to be, in these verses, three things that we're told not to do. Okay? Now some of you might kind of weigh heavier on the, the to-do response part. And some of you might be like, oh, maybe I need to prune a little bit out of my life. Maybe there's some responses that I have that maybe are well-intentioned or things that I'm responding to out of emotion or confusion. But I want to honor the Word of God. So this morning, there's a few things that we do in order to, 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 to look at how God wants to secure us. And the first one, is, we see it in verse 3. Trust the Lord and do good. Right? So there's two things there. Trust in the Lord and do good. And how do you do that? We, so one of the first things we do is we have to we have to confide in God, don't we? You ever found out that you can't really help a person until you know them? Like if someone just walks up to you, hey, can you uh, fix my problem? Well, what's your problem? Oh, I really don't want to talk about this. I really don't know what to say to you though. Can you share with me? Can you tell me? Can you, by sharing your story, can we build a little bit of trust here? Can you trust that I will be in your corner on your side? To see you come out of this on the other side, maybe a, a step better than where you're at right now? And that's what God desires from us. We're supposed to trust in Him, confide in Him, even rest in Him. Because if we don't do that, what happens? There's no rest. Instead, we'll be allowing the mind and the heart and soul to be disturbed. There's evil all around us. There's, there's wicked men and women in this world. We have to look at that, don't we? We have to look at that and say, 
that's the way that it is. Did we get kind of bogged down in the line about that? I don't want to deal with this crap anymore. And you look at some of these people that are evil, wicked people, and some of the evil that is in this world, and you look at them, a lot of these people are prosperous, and apparently even happy. Which is a little more frustrating, isn't it? And because these people, because they may injure you in your person or your reputation, what is it that our response can be that is the best thing for us in our relationship with the Lord? Yeah, we just kind of say, uh, this hurts. This hurts, and I have, I have, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what I have outside of you. We can trust and confide in Him to say, God, not just push it off on Him, but to bring it before Him and place the issues that we are carrying around in our own strength, which is not usually very good. and in his capable hands because we know that he rules. Amen? We know that God rules and that whatever he permits, which is the sticking point, why, God, am I going through this? We know that he, whatever he permits, hear this, is wisely and sovereignly permitted. Than whatever may occur. This is the long view and trust, right? Whatever may occur, it will be overruled for his own glory and the good of his universe. Find in the Lord, trust in him. Can he carry the burdens better than you? Does he know better than you? Does he ultimately have everything under his control? And do I? I know it's hard and difficult to release things into the care of another. Especially when maybe his sovereign plan isn't what I want. Especially when you're being hurt by other people. Or can you just take a moment? Take if there are wicked people in the world, if wickedness abounds around us, there is all the more reason for our desire to do good. So trust and then do good. You repay evil for evil, who is that helping? Now that's the flesh talking. We like that. We like justice until it comes to us. Right? We, we like the idea of somebody's going to get theirs unless we're talking about us. Because we're all under condemnation by God. We're all children of wrath at one point in time before we were saved by Christ. But if wickedness is all around us, it's everywhere, that is all the more reason for our desire, not just that of obedience, but our desire for the betterment of things is to do good. Others are doing evil. What should we be doing? Good. If they are wicked. We cannot do a better work than to do good. And even to, this is the hard part, even to that person. I don't know what that looks like. There's there's not like a plug and chug thing in the scripture that says, well, here's the circumstance. Now, if, if they did A, you do be, then you'll get C out of this. And then it'll be like the Christian movies where everybody's happy then, right? Everybody got saved and everybody's rejoicing. If they're wicked, we can't do anything better than to try to do what's right by the Lord to that person. It's the best way of beating the wickedness of the world is to do good. Romans 12. Verse 17 says, 
Don't repay evil for evil. Lord, just don't do it. This is what you want to do. Amen? Amen? Amen. You have to do yours, right? And you know, here, here, here's the, the scary part. Many of them will. Many of them will. Another way of doing good. This is something that plagues me, plagues many people. We have all these things running through our mind of what to respond out of hurt to another person. You have that inward conflict, that inward conversation, that struggle in the mind. Sometimes that's a battle that's lost, even though maybe we can keep our behavior on check. We still lost the battle here, didn't we? One of the best ways, and this is this false line of doing good, the best way to keep the mind from complaining and grumbling is to be always engaged in doing something that is redeeming. Right? Because we can sit around the table and sling mud all day long. And I'm not talking about being real in your profession to other people with things you're struggling about. I'm talking about sitting around the table and cutting people down that aren't even there, and they might deserve it. But is that helpful to your soul? Is it helpful to the place where your mind is? It's the best way to kind of, it's almost like God saying, you want to distract you away from this garbage, because if you sling mud, you get your own hands dirty, don't you? So in order to not do that, I want you to be about doing what is good. To have the mind always occupied in something that's valuable and useful to the kingdom of God. Each one should have so much of his own to do that he or she will have no need to sit down and just murmur and complain and to allow the mind to listen to this prey on itself or to corrode for lack of good thinking because in Christ we have everything we need, don't we? What do you, what do you lack? The believer, what do you lack in Christ? And I know, I know this is like, because like putting this together, I'm like, this sucks because i got to make sure I'm, I'm doing this too, God. I've watched some people, I've watched some people that have been like totally decimated by other people and they're like, hey, how do I go out and serve the Lord while I'm serving other people. And I'm super proud of people when I when I when you see that because they could just be sitting there just small and like, oh you know, nothing good is ever gonna happen again in the world and instead of like, hey, if I do something for you. And as I do that, I'm actually serving God in the process. I'm using the gifts that He's given me. I, I'm I'm in a time of, of lowness, but I'm picking somebody else up in the meantime while I'm leaving room for God to work here in my own life. Proverbs 3, 5 through 8 says, Trust in the Lord of all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways. In how many ways? All, all, all your all. ways. Submit to him and he will make your path straight. Verse 7, this is what kind of really hits me dead center. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil, and this will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Here's another thing. Trust in your God. Take the light. This is verse 4. Take the light in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. My mother-in-law uses that verse all the time, and it's like, no, 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 it's not what, no. It's like you're, you're talking about a vacation. You're, you're talking about a new car. You're, you're talking about what? I shouldn't have said that. Maybe the watch. I don't know. Anyway. Um, <laughs> hey, wait. Rewind. Hello. 
There's a mother-in-law out there. <laughs> Somewhere. I don't know. I don't know. I'm roll, rolling the dice. It probably happened at some point, some point in time. Where you see that singular verse and you take it out of the context of suffering. And you say, well, if I just ask God for something, he's going to give me the desires of my heart. Well, where's your heart? Is your heart in full pursuit of the Lord? Because everything in full pursuit of God to his glory and worship, everything that you ask for is going to be everything he would want to give you. The askings are the requests of your heart. What you really desire will be granted to you. That is, the fact that you seek your happiness in him will actually regulate your desires then. It. It's not your desires, it's how God transforms you so that you have the same desires that God has. It's when your will and God's will are indistinguishable. This is what he wants, this is what I want. So everything that I ask for then is in line with what he would have already wanted to give me according to his plan and purpose. seeking after God will regulate our desires so that we will be disposed to ask only those things which will be proper for him to grant. The fact that you do find joy and fulfillment in him will be a reason why he will grant your desires. The fact that a child loves his father and finds his happiness in doing his will will do much to direct his own wishes or desires and the will at the same time be a reason why the father will be given over to love his son in the way the son understands love from the father. So everything that I would ask would be from a position of purity, God. Nothing selfish. I <clears throat> know something right now, and I, I just want to ask God that you would grant the thing that your son would ask of his father in this position, in this circumstance. And much of it is, Lord, free me up from the things that would allow me to ask things apart from your will. Charles Spurgeon said, oh, what I would not give to be holy and to be rid of sin and of every evil thing about me. How wonderful what our conversation with God be. Verse 5, commit your way to the Lord, trust in Him, and He will do this. We're going to get to this in just a second. But commit your way to the Lord. The Hebrew there it is better translated, roll your way upon the Lord. So it's like you're taking something that's kind of a burden and you're you're kind of pushing, kind of like a big rock or a barrel, and you're like, here, God, I'm going to bring this over to you. And look how cumbersome this is for me to move it by myself. The idea of rolling a heavy burden from ourselves on another or laying it upon God so that he may bear it. And the burden which we have not got strength to bear, we take this and say, God, I can't carry this in my own strength. Please, you have to take this. The term way, when you wave to the Lord, means the act of going. Okay? It's like your course of life. But the manner in which a person actually lives, so the reference here is to the whole course of life. It's not just like, I'm in a bad place right now, I'm going to trust God right now, and then when everything's better again, I kind of revert or default back to trusting Dave as being the one that's actually in charge, or the one that knows best. The way here is referring to, it's everything that can affect your life at all times. And all our plans are our conduct. All the issues or results of plans. Everything.
everything in regards to the manner in which we live and all its results are to be committed to the Lord. And the Hebrew word says, He will do this. He says, God's going to do something here. He says, He will do this. That is, He will bring it, whatever's happening, to a proper and honoring point to Him. And He will secure in Himself a wonderful result. He does this. He will take care of your interests at this point because they are His, right? If you trust in a God, you say, I, I want this to be done because, God, that's what you would have done. This is the Lord's Prayer, right? God, whatever you're doing in heaven, whatever your will is, I want that done right here, right now, through me. That's so why we trust God to take care of your interests because they're actually His interests. He will not permit you to suffer needlessly or ultimately be wronged. A specific item in your life, God is going to protect your, not hear this, guys. As it appears in the next verse, is your reputation before Him and other people and your character before Him and other people. But you go through a lot, right? Like, how do you come out of that unscathed? Because people are lobbing grenades and accusations, and it's just like, how do I come out from under all of this, God? God, what are you going to do here? Charles Spurgeon also said the night of affliction is just as much under the arrangement and control of the Lord of love as the bright summer days when all is bliss. Jesus in, is in the tempest. He's right there with you. want then to trust God. Okay, God, uh, they're saying stuff about me. I'm the one getting hurt. How do I deal with this? God, when you said you would protect my character, my integrity, my reputation. In verse 7, it says, be still or rest. Be still before the Lord, wait patiently for him. What's one of the worst things you can do to try to prove that you're not wrong in a situation. Maybe what's one of the worst things I can do? Try to prove it. Lean on our understanding? Well, how could that manifest itself? Yeah. <laughs> right? Lots of words. Yes. If you get to the place where you have to defend yourself, you already lost. Now, it doesn't mean just say nothing ever, but if someone has already formulaically said, this is who I think you are, are you going to change their mind by just coming in with a different perspective? Or telling them that you're more right than they are? Now, we're not talking about black and white, wrong and right kind of things. We're talking about character and accusations in the middle of trials and times. And the Hebrew word here where it says, be still or rest before the Lord wait patient for, patiently for him, the Hebrew word here means to be mute. Silent, still. Hence, to be silent to anyone. That is, to listen in silence. And the idea in the phrase here, be silent, is to be silent to the Lord. Instead of waiting in silent patience or confidence for God's planned intervening. Or in other words, of leaving the whole matter with him without being anxious as to the result. Easier said than done, yes? But, but you say, but Dave, it seems like God is delaying from coming and rescuing me out of this. Because if he's going to rescue my character and my reputation, when does this actually happen? Because I'd rather have it be sooner than later. The 
it seems like sometimes God delays. And it appears strange that He didn't step in and stop somebody from doing or saying something evil about you. God, why didn't you step in then? They wonder why you would let an innocent person to be falsely accused, but you're not to be anxious and troubled. God does not always intervene on behalf of the innocent at once. And there may be in that time where you are called just to kind of be silent. You don't have to defend yourself because they've already, they've already, you know, come up with an idea of who you are. Like Jesus doesn't even do that, does he? Like the lamb led to the slaughter. That lamb is not yelling curses at anybody. He is not trying to give a rationale why he shouldn't be slaughtered. He, he's just led right over to it. on your behalf when you are the one that is trusting in him you're doing good and right and resting in him there may be ways that God in his sovereignty is allowing you to go through that because it's the best place for you to mature in the middle of that difficulty in life it's in the discipline of your own spirit allows you to bring out in your spirit grace for other people which God himself shows to us it allows you to, to be gentle and patient forgiving it allows to lead you to examine yourself and to understand your own character which may mean that God may not intercede immediately or at least in the way that you would want him to but like here's where you start bearing the most fruit in life is in the fertile soil of the deepest part of the valley. And trust me and trust Christ in your response. These are the things that we are to do. We're to, to trust and do good and delight and commit and rest and wait. But then the psalmist also steps and says, Now there's things I don't want you to do. This is from God himself, amen? Mm -hmm. Inspiration means breathed into by God. And so this is what God himself is saying. Here's a few things not to do. In verse one, do not be envious of those who do wrong. Do look at something like why do they keep being able to skate on things when clearly there are best inconsistencies in how they live? And, like, and you're like, and everybody can see it. Why in the world are they getting away with these things? You'd be like, I wonder what I can get away with. You know, if you want to play a little dirty pool, maybe I can play that game as well. And I, you're tempted to do that, aren't you? Yeah. And that's one of the, the responses that the culture is actually promoting. Hey, if somebody does something to you, do it back to them twice as bad, right? If somebody walks up and smacks you, okay. hit them twice as hard. That's what the culture says, right? But we don't want to look at people and say, well, gosh, they're getting away with all kinds of crazy stuff we know is wrong. I wonder what that would leave for an allowance for me in my life. What would I get away with? Maybe I didn't even leverage that to get back at them for some stuff that they did to me. Anybody ever had like those moments where you're like, gosh, I'm good at this stuff. <laughs> right? But envy is <clears throat> something that causes pain and discontent. It does it with a weird degree of understanding because we think that the person that we're watching and we could envy or want to be like, that we think that they're being happy or successful in the place that they're at. 
It might be just an apparent success or prosperity. Maybe they're more dead inside than we can even imagine. Why in the world would I want to be like that? It's the result of a comparison of ourselves with others who are more highly gifted or favored, or more, more successful than we are in ourselves. Or the feeling referred to here is that which springs up in the mind when we see persons of corrupt or wicked character they prosper while we who are endeavoring to do right are left to like poverty or disappointment or to tears God says don't envy that person even though from a very pragmatic way you can say yeah but I was like them things might be better in life and God says no it's not true don't envy the person that's doing wrong. Verse 8, here's another one. Refrain from anger and turn it from wrath. Oh, Lord, why do you have to put that one in there? I have a really good sense of justice for other people, and my anger level is like off the charts sometimes, Lord. In fact, if you're looking for something to help dole out punishments at the end time, call me up. I'm ready to go, man. Let's do this. But refrain from anger and turn from wrath. This is what God says. It says, you know, cease from anger because there are wicked people and they are for some reason in God's total understanding of things are permitted to carry out their plans but do not allow your mind to be consumed with envious or fretful or wrathful or murmuring feelings against God right because we want our will to be his like his and so the things that are happening in our mind, and our soul, and our heart are murmurings against God because He bears patiently with those people and because they are allowed to temporarily prosper and triumph in life. So it's not something that is against them, it's also against the Lord. Because it's not according to what He desires from those people as they if they act in a wicked, sinful, rotten way. That's not what God wants. And you say, well, he's prospering them. No, he's allowing them to prosper. God sends the rain to the just and the unjust. But it's for a certain time. There's a shelf life to being evil in a world in front of the Holy God. Amen? Thank the Lord for that. It's temporary in its prosperity and triumph. So we, in our response to seeing that in other people or in circumstances, is to refrain from anger and turn breath. And what do you do? I'm going to say, anyway. That's right. So, can I get mad? I'm going to go back and pray. <laughs> you know what that is? 2 Corinthians 4, verse 8 says, We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Yeah? We're perplexed, like, I don't get this, God. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. That is the place where we find ourselves when we don't give in to the temptation to want to take somebody else out because that's what they're doing to themselves. If they don't repent, they're going to fall into the justice of God anyway. Which, as much as you see somebody as an enemy, you do not want that for them either. Ultimately, you do not want that for them. A few weeks ago, we talked about this rich man and Lazarus. Remember that? You got to interpose, like, hey, okay, I don't want to be Lazarus because I want to be with God, and I, I can name the person that's languishing in torment. You don't want that for them. One, because how terrible is that? Two, listen to this, we all deserve that too. Because it's by grace that you have been saved, not by anything you did do or didn't do. Because of God. So our response is be calm, no matter what you see of the wickedness of the world or in people, because God is sovereign and he will dispose of things in the best possible way. Amen? He does that. In verses 7 and 8 it says, Do not fret. Do not fret. The Hebrew word here means to burn. Alright, so it's not like I'm a little 
squeamish or squittish about something, it's don't burn or to be kindled or to be inflamed. Just something that's applied to being angry. As if under its influence we become like heated. You ever get that? Like don't fret as in I'm gonna go sock somebody. Or okay, is this wrong? I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little taste of your own medicine. You want one little bit of that? Here you go. So it means to fret oneself into being angry or indignant. And we should perhaps express the same idea by the word worry. State of mind is when we are worried or envious because others are prosperous and successful. We don't appear to be right now, but here's some counsel for some people that are seeking wisdom from God. Do not fret because of those who are evil or envious of those who do wrong. Amen? That's that first verse. And this opening verse is the basic outlook for those maturing in God. Yeah. Don't fret or be envious or angry about those who seem to prosper in their wicked ways. Instead, what does the wise person do? Yeah, the wise person will trust God, do good and delight, commit themselves, rest in God, wait patiently for the Lord. This is the God-honoring cure, cure for the indignation that we have against the world and against other people. As we fall into envy or ceasing to doing what's right from the Lord. And to be honest with you, if we employ these things that the psalmist kind of prescribes a little bit for our response to God in, in troubled times, if we do that, we don't even have to worry about the other three. If you're always doing what's right, do we have to worry about not doing what's wrong? Oh, man. Thank the Lord for that. I don't, have to worry. I don't want to worry about two lists. I just want to do the one. I just want to trust in the thing that he called me into and not worry about not doing the other things, which I shouldn't be doing anyway. First Thessalonians 5 says, in your middle of this time, okay? Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt like this one. <laughs> I don't like this one, Dave. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Remember that? I'll do this. He will do this. He will do this. If you're faithful, if you trust, I'm not going to worry about fretting, envious, getting back at people. I'm going to rest in God, my commitment to Him as He continues to save me and secure me in Himself. What is the ultimate understanding of being secure then? I'm going to wrap this up. R.C. Sproul says we are secure not because we hold tightly to Jesus. I want you guys to hear this, okay? We are not secure because we hold tightly to Jesus, but because he holds tightly to us. For the believer, you cannot be released from the price paid for you on the cross. Right? We, we, owe, we owe him this as he holds tightly to you. Because that price that was paid for you on the cross was paid for by Christ as God punished him in our place. And now if we're going to trust him for that, we trust him for the rest of our lives, which means the rest of our lives look like worship before our Lord, before our Savior, before God. We trust him, we worship him, and we love him. Amen. Amen.
Amen. So this morning, if you're kind of finding yourself in the middle, Lord, I am so tempted to want to go beat the snot out of some people. This is true. Remember that he calls us into something that's higher and more divine in his purpose than doing things according just to the flesh or the feeling or the emotion of things. But if we do this stuff anyway, it's just a downward spiral because not only are we trying to repay evil for evil, but we're being evil. And we can't wield that. And we have sucked right back into it. And then when we do that, we deny our Lord and Savior. So if you're, if you're there, which I know a lot of you are right in smack dab in the middle of this, trust God. All wrongs will be right made right. All injustices will find justice. And in the middle of this, I'm so thankful that God is a God of mercy. Because if we're talking about justice, I deserve everything. I deserve everything in punishment that my sins demand. Christ took that. So I'm going to live in that grace. I'm not I'm going to try to do everything I can by the power of God's spirit that's taken up by his needs to try to turn that around and say, no, 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 no. I know we're going to try to get off the rails here and sometimes people will hear the truth and it'll set them free and sometimes it doesn't. But regardless of the response, we are to respond to God consistently the way that he wants us to. So that not only can our character and reputation be secure, but he is as well. Yes. Yeah. Because if people could, you're a Christian, you treat people like garbage. I want to impugn the Lord of glory because of my short sightedness and stupidity. So stay strong in him, stay close to his word and promises. This morning, we celebrate the Lord's Supper. I have something really beautiful and kind of visceral about the experience of remembering Jesus' sacrifice in this way, about the body broken for us in a very shameful, condemning way, as well as the, the remembering that, that the sins of the world were heaped on Christ. It's not just the holes in the, the wrists or the feet or the crown of thorns or the spear in the side. It's remembering the the separation in the God had it happened because of my rebellion. God breaks himself. The Father turns his back on the Son. This is the only instance that we know of in the entirety of all history where the Father and the Son were not in perfect community and communion with one another. It's because of what I did. And God saw fit to do something else. So fit to make a way so that I could be right with God. Not by my own works. I can't brag about this at all. None of us can. But to rely on what Christ has done as the perfect sacrifice, the perfect Lamb of God. Dies horribly under the wrath of God for our sin. The eternal weight of the punishment and wrath of God rested on him so I don't have to and you don't have to have that for you for all eternity. So this morning we're going to have a word of prayer. We're going to skip the video. We're going to have a word of prayer and then come up and please receive the elements. Just take the bread, just tear it away from the larger piece, dip it in the cup and hold it, we'll take it together. And you come and receive this. Do it with humility. Check yourself before you come. Like, Lord, I want to be, I want to be found faithful in what you called me to. I want to be assured of my salvation before I take this, because it's not bread, it's not magic bread and not magic juice. This doesn't save anybody. It helps us to remember why it is that we are saved. So when you come up and receive the element, just hold on to it. We'll take it together. Wow.
But God, we just thank you for today. Lord, I, I pray that your truth, your, your word is more real to us, it's more manifest in us, and I pray that we, we heard from the Spirit today about the specific situations in our own life, God, because we all have them. We've all been wrong, and we're all tempted to respond in a way that's very unbecoming as somebody that refers to themselves as a little Christ. God, I just pray that this morning, if we need to have a broken heart over this, God, that we do. Or if we need to repent of something here, I pray that we do. Lord, if we have to ask for forgiveness for something, God, I pray that we do that. Because it's something, God, that is pleasing to you. It's about the work of the kingdom, which is about reconciliation. God, maybe that other person will relent, and maybe not. But Lord, we want to be found faithful for you. That's all we have. That's all we can control, God. Was to be found faithful in you. Lord, we thank you for the cross, for the fact that it means that we don't get what we deserve. We thank you for your, your divine mercy. And I thank you, God, for, for knowing that there's no way, there's no way that we could have paid off our own debt before. It. So we look to Christ as the perfect sacrifice and the author and perfecter of the faith that shows us following after you. Help us to trust you more, love you more, be more like your son Jesus. Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity to remember exactly what you did on the cross. It sets us free from the bondage of sin. It allows us to stave off the temptation which you made a way out for us. Thank you. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.